Okay, well, welcome back everybody. So now let's continue with our um, closure of sets. And now let's just prove a couple of important properties um, or techniques that we use on these closures. And the two techniques are induction and recursion. So induction refers to when you want to prove something by induction. And recursion is when you want to build something by recursion using what you built so far you build the new things. Okay, so induction means you're proving something, you assume you prove the previous cases and you prove the next. And recursion, you assume you built the previous cases and you built the next. So what is the setting for uh, the induction principle? So you start with um, a set C generated by certain family functions, starting from a certain set B and by applying the assumptions. Okay, so I now consider a property B. This is a property you want to show that every element has this property P. And what, does, um, what is the assumption? First, you start all the starting points, all the ones in B, satisfy the property P. And then the other property is that um, all um, whenever you have um, a tuple of elements that you know satisfies property P, then if you apply any of the functions in f, the image also satisfies the property p. Um, and then from here, you want to conclude that everybody satisfies p. So let's look at an example uh, before we go to the proof. So let's just look at the case of the natural numbers. So this is the example from the previous video where we get that the closure is exactly the natural numbers uh, inside all the real numbers. And let's say you want to prove something by induction of the natural numbers. So what do you do when you want to prove something in induction of the natural numbers? Let's just state induction for the natural numbers and see if it makes if it's the same thing as the one we have here. So it says the following. If we know that zero satisfies the property P and that whenever a number, we conclude that every natural number N satisfies the property P, right? That's what induction says. If you know it's for zero and you know it for N plus one every time you know it for N, then you can deduce that you know it for all natural numbers, right? So that's exactly what we're going to do here. And the natural numbers are a particular case of, of this thing that we are saying right now. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to do. But now we're going to do it in the general case of a closure of a bunch of functions starting from a bunch of elements, OK? So let's see what is the general statement that we want. So well, that's a statement. So we have the setting. Uh, all the elements of B satisfy P, and if C does, so does F of C. And we want to show that um, everybody in C satisfies P. Okay, so what is the proof of this? Well, what we want to show the claim is that the set, let's call it Roman P, is a set of all the things, all the elements, let's call them little u in u in our universe, that satisfy P, P, that that set is inductive. If P is inductive, then this C must be included in C, because if so, C will be included in this set P. And we will have that everybody in C satisfies the property uh, calligraphic P. Okay, so let's see why that's the case. Why is that this set is inductive? Well, all elements of B satisfy the property. So that means that B is included in P. OK, so that's the first part of being inductive. And if uh, C satisfy P, so that's F of C for all the functions that we have in our family, so we get that P is closed. Right, so essentially, right, so these two say P is inductive. And if it's inductive, then C has to be a subset of it. So very simple. So then if you want to prove something about terms, all we have to do is first prove it about the variables, and then prove that whenever we know it's true for a certain formulas, then it's going to be true for whatever we get by applying the connectives to them. Okay, so let's look at recursion. 
we have the same setting and now this time we want to just simplify the setting a little bit just to to be able to state the theorem better because otherwise it gets too messy the notation but from this version you should be able to uh, define like think of the general case you just extend this to the general case uh, so this should be general enough but maybe simpler to write so in this case we have two functions so f takes two inputs and g takes only one input Okay, so and and then we have a set B, and the idea is that we need we want to define functions by recursion. So in the example of the natural numbers that we did before, what does it mean to define a function by recursion? Sometimes we define a function, let's say like the function uh, factorial. How do we define factorial? You say well, zero factorial is equal to one, and n plus one factorial is equal to n multiplied by n factorial multiplied by n plus 1. Maybe have you seen a definition like this before? So this is a recursive definition. So we define it at 0 and first and then whenever we define it at n plus 1 using the value that we had at n. So that's the definition by recursion. We use the previous one to define the next value. Okay, so in our general setting of closed sets, we need to um, assume one, one more thing, and is that the set is generated freely. Freely means that um, the set B and the image of F and the image of G are all disjoint. So that means that not, no terms get confused, right? So this means, equivalently, means that uh, for every little c in the set c it can be built only in one way so either c belongs to b and it was at the beginning or c is equal to f of some tuple s for some unique s in um, C less than omega or C equals G of S for some unique S in less than omega okay so that's what it means to have to be freely generated we should add to the definition that they are disjoint and F and G are one to one so there's only one, only one way to build things they are so every element either comes from F or comes from G or start from the beginning. And if it comes from F, you know where it came from. If it comes from G, you know where it came from. For instance, in the case of the terms, it's very important that the terms, the, the well-found formulas are generated freely. Because if you want, if you have a well-found formula, you want, you want to know how was it built, right? So if you see in that example, if you see the formula, then you know this was built by applying the implication on A1 or A2 and A3, right? That's the only way to get this formula here from um, applying the operation. The only way to apply it is using the implication. So that's why it's free, it's, it's not a way. If you, had, if you didn't have the parentheses though, it wouldn't be freely generated. Because if you didn't have the parentheses, and if you had a1 or a2 implies a3, well, maybe this comes from an application of implication, but also maybe this is uh, application of or of two things, right? It could be the or of this and the or of this guy for separate separated. So you did you wouldn't know how you build it if, if you first did the or or first you did the, the implies. Um, and it wouldn't be free and you wouldn't know how to read the formula. So it's very, very important that they are freely generated, the formulas. The same with the natural numbers. Okay, so freely generated means it's a unique way to build each single element. So let's go to recursion. So recursion says the following. Suppose that C is freely generated. Um, and now, so we consider a little, a little function H that is defined on on our set V. So here we have 
our set C and inside is B and here is our set V and we have, what do we have? We have a function here that comes from here to here, that's little h. Okay, it's only defined in B. And now we have two functions, capital F and capital G, and they go inside here. So F takes two inputs and takes one, this is F, and G takes one input and outputs one. All right? And our C is uh, the set generated by F. So inside here we have our function little f and we have our function g. Right, those are inside the C side. And now we're given capital F and capital G on the V side. Okay, so that's our given, right? So we're given is, let's put them in black, the given is this H, this F, and this G. And now what we want to do is extend this, uh, this bar up here. Extend this h to something called h bar that is defined everywhere on c. Because if the previous h was defined only on the b part, now we want to define it everywhere on c. And we want to use um, this capital F and capital G to tell us how to do it. Well, so H on B, uh, F is going to be, H bar and H are the same. So that's why it's an extension. And then, and then every, every element of C, uh, since it's freely generated, is being generated, it either comes from B or is generated by F or is generated by G. Right? So it's one of those three. There is nothing else. So if it's generated by F, F has two inputs, that's our, our assumption right here. If it's generated by F, what we want H bar to be of this guy is what we get by applying capital F to this guy and this guy, right? And if it's generated by G, we want to see what H bar did on little x and then apply capital G, okay? So notice that, so essentially here we have the term F of X, Y, that's been built one step after x and y. So suppose we know already what h bar is on x and y, and using the values that we know about x, um, h bar of x and h bar of y, we build the value of h bar on f x y. Yeah. So we build the value on this complicated term using the values on the simpler terms, and our function capital S. So what's an example of uh, such a definition by recursion? So we saw one already. So the definition of the truth assignment was exactly by induction like that, by recursion like this, right? So we started with uh, evaluation V that was a formula that went, that was a function that went from the set of variables to true false. And then we wanted to extend it to a truth assignment that goes from all well-formed well -formed formulas to uh, true false, right? And we said, well, in the variables, the V and V bar do exactly the same thing. And then you have to see what it does on the bigger formulas. And then to define on the bigger formulas, you use the previous one, right? So if you remember, if you had, if you wanted to define V bar on a formula that is of the form uh, phi and psi, then you, what do you do? Well, you use the fact that you know what it is on phi and you know what it is on psi, and then you apply. So that's exact. That is, if you guys remember what these guys was, b of the and. You guys remember what this is? Maybe I guess the way we wrote it before was a one and a two. Is the boolean function associated to and? Right. It takes two truth values and it gives you a truth value that is true if and only if both of the original ones were true. And this function, already two, and you apply to v bar of phi and v bar of psi, right? So if, if two, both of them are true, you get true. If one of them is false, you get false. Um, and then, so you're using the previous values to get the new value. Like here, you're using the previous value 
to get the new value. Okay, so essentially, uh, this guy up here is from the example in the previous video. This is f and of phi comma psi, and we are defining essentially the v bar on these guys. And then this function here is our capital F that we are applying on the previous values. Okay, so for F and we have a capital F, and then for F or we're gonna have another capital F, right? For like for little g, we have a function g. For each function in our family F, we are gonna have uh, another function that corresponds to it on the v side, right? So we have one the little functions on on this side, and for each of those we have a corresponding one on this side. Uh, like the one for or is the boolean function that gives you true if one of the two guys is true. The one for implies, well, you guys who know what the those are. Good. All right, see you guys next time.